And the people begin to think, oh no, not those two again. <laughs> Please, not another one of those jokes. <laughs> no, we just have a few more announcements for you we want to cover. <laughs> no, that is not true. Of course, Pastor Dale is, is gone, and as uh, usual when, when he is, one of us usually steps in to, uh, to, to share the word with you today, and we thought, hey... We do announcements together, I right? Yeah, we could preach together, and we so. can coordinate our outfits, and we can coordinate our outfits. Yes, that worked out. What do you guys nice. think? We yeah. look good. <laughs> that was slow. That was yeah, slow. I don't think we do. <laughs> I don't think we do. Well, here we go. Let's try this. Let's do it. Let's see if it One works. of the things that I absolutely love growing up is the stories of my father. How many of you had dads that told stories? Okay. <laughs> yes, and I've noticed as he's getting older, the stories become more and more elaborate, and they're a little bit different than they were when I was a kid, but I absolutely loved hearing about him as a young man and all the wild adventures he had and things like that. The, he, uh, one of my favorites was when he would talk about when, they, when him and his friends would drive race cars, and they drove a lot of race cars, a lot of sports cars in the late 60s, and uh, he had a race car, he was on a race car team with an E-type Jaguar, right, and all these cool stories and how they used to rebuild motors in the hotel bathtub and stuff, and he'd always say, you know, don't do that, but we did, you know, and you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You've heard your dads. I mean, when you're growing up, your dad is a, is a hero. He's a legend, right? And I love these stories because they gave me insight into who my dad was beyond what I could see as a kid, and uh, they, they gave me a deeper appreciation for who he was, okay? And Brian and I, Brian found this story that we're going to talk about today, and uh, it just struck me of how the Old Testament is full of stories exactly like this, and how important stories are to us as human beings. We learn from, we learn from them, we get a deeper appreciation for who we are as people through them, and th this Old Testament story that we're going to talk about today gives us a picture into the character of God, and it's a theme we see throughout all of Scripture, Okay. Uh, we relate to each other, and we relate to the characters in these stories of how and who God is, okay? And I think that's why the Bible is full of these kind of things. We learn the tangible qualities, if you will, of an invisible God, okay? So today we're going to talk about one story that's never made it to the movie screen, although if it did, it would definitely have an R rating. You know, two youth pastors probably chose a very gory and bloody story on purpose. We love these things. How many of you like Old Testament weirdo stories? Come on. We got on. one for you. Okay, we got one for you today. If you didn't raise your, cake, your hand, we know... Internally, you're like, I totally love him, okay? It's about a child king or a, a king who started as a child. It's a story about body piercing and redemption, okay? So if you're into that kind of thing, we got a good one for you today. It's a, about a man named Manasseh. Be careful how you say his name, lest you swear in church, Brian. No, we can't have that. No, no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> Manasseh. <laughs> Manasseh was uh, quite the character. He, uh, he was a king who had the longest reign of any other king in Judah. He reigned for 55 years, as Sam alluded. He took the throne at the age of 12. So he ruled from the age of 12 to 67. Uh, he took the throne right after his father, Hezekiah, uh, passed away. Hezekiah was an amazing king, a great king that loved God. He, he died, and Manasseh took over. Now, to kind of give some context to when this all happened, I know uh, perhaps you're aware of King David and his son, King Solomon, in the Old Testament. This happened quite a ways after uh, their reign, so it kind of sets, uh, sets it up as to where this takes place. And Israel found itself in, a, in kind of a, 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 a tough situation. Israel was going through a series of, of good leadership and then bad leadership, and then good leadership and then bad leadership. And as a result, it was also a time of God's blessing and God removing his blessing, and God blessing and God removing his blessing. Well, Manasseh, he, uh, as a king, fell into the category of bad leadership. He was a mess. He's he nice. was a bad, bad leader, a bad dude, as you're going to soon find out. Um, and so when he took the throne, I mean, he, he just started making a mess of his life. He truly did. He just made a mess of his life, and as a result, uh, the, the whole kingdom of Israel suffered. They suffered because of this, of this mess that he was creating, and I'll let you kind of net out what he did. So taking over the throne at age 12, I mean, think about that for a minute. Um, you'd have to have a, either a lot of oversight or 
I don't know. It's just a bad idea. I get kind of a, of a picture of these child actors who have all this success and all this money, right? And they absolutely ruin their lives into adulthood. And this is kind of where Manasseh was, okay? Uh, I, you know, Benny is 12, right? Mm -hmm. He's, okay. Imagine if Benny ruled America. No, okay, no, my so son this is be, not <laughs> this, So we, we'd have some issues. Let's just, let's just say it that way, okay? You, no one wants a junior higher running the country. No. And, and so this is kind of, you know, this is kind of, Manasseh had a tough start. He's in the shadow of his very godly and good father, uh, and he doesn't make the transition very well, okay? So, so the Bible describes literally in the first, after the first mention of his name, all the things Manasseh did wrong. Prepare to be amazed at this list, okay? He did evil in the Lord's sight, and it looks like this. He built pagan altars in the temple of God, okay? So literally in church, you know, say there's just this right here. We build an altar to worship Satan, if you will, right here in the middle of church, right? This is what this guy's doing, okay? He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft. All these things are, are terrible, terrible things to do if you're in the Old Testament, okay? He sacrificed his own son, his own children in the fire to some very weirdo gods. This is the level with which Manasseh had wandered away from, from following God. He represents a nation chosen by God to deliver the message of God to the people. And here he is, worshiping all these foreign gods, doing all this horrible, horrible stuff, okay? Now, I get this question a lot from students. I want to mention it uh, very quickly. Why would anyone do what Manasseh is doing? I mean, you're sacrificing your own children Okay, killing your own children for these weirdo gods. Why would anyone do this? And it's, we see a, in this list a steady decline of sin. It starts small, where he throws uh, altars up, and then we're just worshiping. And then pretty soon he finds himself in this terrible, terrible decline of, of deprivation and sin. This is the nature of sin, and we're going to see it, it gets worse. Okay? Manasseh also led the entire country to do the same things he was doing. Okay, this is found in, uh, in 2 Chronicles 33, which is where we're talking about today. In your bulletin, there's a short, uh, short? Well, it's small. Half -size there's sheet. a half-size sheet <laughs> with the entire story. Yes, it's green. I encourage you to read this on your own. It, it is a fascinating story for a lot of different reasons we're going to talk about today. It's also found in 2 Kings <coughs> chapter 21. And in that account in 2 Kings, this is the description of what Manasseh's sin did. It says this, that Manasseh filled Jerusalem, the capital city, from end to end with innocent blood. And this is the result of this man's disobedience against God. This guy was a mess, okay? He was evil. For, for lack of any better term, he was evil, okay? Now, we can read these terms, and we can read these things in the Bible, and it would be very difficult to relate in 2018 to this level of disobedience, okay? So, I, 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 and this level of damage to a nation, it's easy to go, like, but that's kind of fairy tale stuff, Sam, you know, pa pr pagan worship and things like that. What is that? Is Grimm's fairy tale? What is that, okay? Is that something I'm going to watch on Netflix? Probably don't, okay? It's a bad <laughs> idea. But let me put a real-world application to you. How many of you have read lately in the news or at any time about a, a pastor of some large organization church uh, having some kind of moral failure? How many of you have read this before, okay? And you read about what happens as a result, how people uh, leave the church. They leave a relationship with God. They, they, uh, they, you, you read stories of how maybe church leadership covered up these sins because they were worried about losing parishioners or, you know, losing money from the church. And, and so as a result of this man who's in leadership sin, the entire nation sins as well. Okay? And this is a huge illustration for those of us with influence. When we disobey God, we lead others to do the same. Mm -hmm. And this is what's going on in Israel, okay? People quickly followed Manasseh's example, and they forgot who they were. They were supposed to be a nation with the good news, bringing it to the people around them. That they were no better than anybody 
else around them. The second uh, Chronicles 33 verse 9, Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. God's chosen people more wicked than the wicked people around them. When we kind of look at church failures like this, or moral failures at pastor, we kind of see the same thing. You know, we don't see that level of nastiness, if you will, in, in uh, secular organizations, how these men have manipulated people or manipulated women or they've stolen money. It's all, you don't necessarily always see that. It just feels more wicked when it comes from church. Does that make sense for you guys a little bit? This is the level of what's going on. Okay? And it also describes this in uh, the next verse that God desperately tried to get their attention, Manasseh's attention, God's people's attention, and he did that through the prophets. They would show up in the courts and they would scream, you're sinning, why are you doing this? There's innocent blood everywhere. This is the wrong way to live. And Manasseh and the people of Israel ignored it. Yeah. They refused to listen. You know, in a lot of ways, that reminds us of the way we live our lives. Have you ever found yourself in, in such... Um, a mess that it, it, you look no better than the world around you, sometimes perhaps even worse, as, as Sam just described. And what happens is that we begin to hide it. We hide our sin. We, we hide it for so long that we begin to compensate for it, right? Or, or we justify it. We justify it to ourselves or we justify it to the people around us. And, and when we do that, what happens is it begins to, to, to kind of fester within our souls. And, and it just makes a mess of us. And oftentimes it takes hitting rock bottom for us to really hear from God and to figure out, man, what, the mess that we're in and, and our need for God. I, but oftentimes rock bottom looks very differently for different people. I've, I've uh, worked with many people over the years, and now for some, I can think of a couple right now, rock bottom for them was sitting in a jail cell for a very long time. That was their rock bottom, and it was at that moment that God got their attention. For others, rock bottom might look like no longer being able to see your children because of the mess that, that, a, that an individual has made in their life. They are no longer to see their children, or maybe the destruction of a career, or maybe even, even your health uh, because of the stress, or perhaps even the sin, your own health begins to deteriorate. Or maybe, maybe it's just living a life of lies. Man, that's a horrible place to be. To live a life of lies where you can't truly be honest with anybody because you don't want them to see the life that you're living. You can't even be honest with yourself. You're trapped. You're trapped in the lies that you create, and it literally imprisons you. And that's exactly where we find Manasseh. He has hit rock bottom, and God finally gets a hold of his attention. Absolutely. Want to take the rest of that story? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, as a result, God sends the Assyrian army, okay? And these were longtime uh, uh, enemies of Israel, uh, longtime, you know, very, very uh, violent uh, is the word I'm trying to find. But they're also, they worship very pagan gods in very violent ways, very opposite, opposite of who God was, of peace and order. And these Assyrians, God sent them in, the Old Testament says, uh, and they conquered uh, the, this in Jerusalem, and they took Manasseh captive, okay? Now, uh, his freedom was completely removed, and the Bible describes that, that they caught Manasseh, they put a ring in his nose, and they shackled him up, and they led him away to Babylon. This is the body-piercing part in the title, if you didn't know that already, okay? Now, if Manasseh is super into heavy metal, he's stoked, but he's not, okay? <laughs> and this is a great description of, uh, of how you would treat, in the Old Testament times, a wild animal. Because if you have the, the control of this area of that animal, uh, then you have basically control over the animal, okay? Uh, this is a symbol of how wild and out of control Manasseh is. And I read a commentary this last week that described that, well, this was probably a metaphor. I don't know if it was or not. But here is Manasseh, only, only broken from his sin and at rock bottom with a ring in his nose in the hated uh, uh, nation of Babylon in chains, embarrassed and alone and in the dark and sin leads us to this kind of darkness. Mm -hmm. It's the number one reason that God hates 
sin. Here he is, a ring in his nose, bound in chains and locked up. But, but there is hope. Mm. Now, all throughout the Bible. There are stories like this, where men have, and women have developed these long lists of sin, long lists of horrible atrocities, and God doesn't abandon them. And so we can look, we can look at these stories and we go, right, I've never done anything that bad. Good grief, this guy's a mess, right? God's fine with me. But we have a list of sin that is destroying or has destroyed in some way, shape, or form our life. Mm -hmm. But there is hope for us. So please don't, don't separate yourself from this story because we're in it. This is us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And this is where God enters into the story. This is where the story means the most. It illustrates the very nature, the tangible qualities of God. Here's a story that happens thousands of years before Jesus walks on the earth. Thousands of years but it describes the timeless characteristics of God, the never-changing the never changing nature, excuse me, of the God who sent Jesus. The Bible is full of this, and this is why we chose this story today. Yeah. Manasseh repents at his lowest of the low, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's that verse right there. Uh, but why, in 2 Chronicles 33, it says, But while in deep distress Manasseh sought the Lord... And sincerely, here's the key word, if you got a pen, circle this, humbled, humbled himself before God, uh, before the God of his answer, uh, ancestors. The key word there is humbled. That's so important. Why? Because repentance is birthed in humility. Repentance only happens when we humble ourselves. When we come before him in humility, uh, James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and what? He will lift you up. He will lift you up in honor when we humble ourselves. Humility is a lot like uh, pulling the curtain back and showing who we really are, mess and all. I, I, it reminds me of the, the famous children's story, Wizard of Oz. How many of you have seen that? We all know Wizard, Wizard of Oz, Oz right? How, how, okay. how, how's the story go? Well, Dorothy and her friends, uh, they're, they're traveling to, to, to find the wizard, and, and, and they see this giant, intimidating persona speaking to them, calling to them, you know, come, come follow me. And what happens? Toto, her little dog, uh, sneaks up and pulls away the curtain, and what is, what's revealed? It's not this big, giant man. It's this little, old, wrinkly old man. It's just this little guy. <laughs> yeah. How you many of you know what we're talking about? <laughs> yeah. How it's, many of you are mad it's we not, just spoiled it? Exactly. For the rest I'm sorry <laughs> if I spoiled it. It's, <laughs> it's not the truth. And you know what? So oftentimes we try to portray a false image of ourselves. We like to appear like we have it all together. We got it going on. We got it all together. And yet humility, the life that God calls us into, portrays something entirely different. Humility means being who we are fully. Whereas pride says, I have it all together. It's presenting an image that's untrue. It's this, it's this thinking that says, I don't need God. I don't need God. I'm, I'm in control of my life. I got it all together. That is pride. And yet humility shows us who we really are, mess and all. It makes me think of a funny story in my life. When, I, when this kind of for the first time was driven home to me. This is a good one, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good one. I was in junior high at the time, and uh, you and I, we, we, li we dig hanging out with junior hires. Yes. They're, just, they're just awesome people. Yeah. Yes, they Free are. people, but they're smelly. cool. Smelly. Yeah, smelly, yes. But, yeah. <laughs> and uh, like all of you, I was one of them at a time. And when you are a junior high boy, there's like one thing on the brain, right? Girls. Girls, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> how to impress them, how to get their attention, and hopefully even gain their affection. Well, I was no different, and uh, I, uh, I, man, I wanted to show the girls how awesome I was. <laughs> but you know what? I really wasn't that awesome, and I knew it. But you know what? I, you, you got to appear that way, and so I hatched a plan. This is the way it worked out for me. Uh, at my junior high, it, we had a football team, and it was a home game a home football game, and, and I had my bike. I lived close enough to the school I could ride my bike to and fro, so I rode my bike up to the game. And so I'm sitting on my bike, and I'm watching the game play out. I'm watching the cheerleaders do their thing, and I thought, man, I gotta get their attention somehow. 
This needs to be about me. That's this what you're needs to be this, Yes, this needs to be about me. Forget the football players. <laughs> Look at me, because I'm really cool. And so, so I came up with this idea. Now, I, I was pretty proficient on my bicycle. I got, I got pretty good at like riding wheelies. You know, you pop that front wheel up and you ride it. I was pretty good at that. So I thought, this is my chance. Chicks I, dig that. I, the they chicks dig, dig it. it. Yeah, yes. gets yeah. them every time. I can could, I could ride, ride a wheelie right along the sidelines of the football field. Man, and I, I'm going to get them. And, and so that's what I did. Now, let me stop the story. Let's rewind the tape about two days, about a day and a half. You see, a day and a half before that happened, I thought, I need to get new grips on my bike. I need to put new grips on it. So I, I took the old ones off. Now, the way we put them on so they slide on real easy is you just squirt a little bit of armor all into them, into each grip, and they just shoo, slide right on, no problem. But the thing that I forgot, it takes about a day for the armor all to dry. And so, so now, let's get back to the story. So here I hatch this plan. I'm going to impress the girls. I go right along the sideline, and I, and I go to pull up. <laughs> Both grips come off. The bike goes flying that way. I go flying that way. I'm laying on my backside, holding my grips. <laughs> and, and suffice it to say, I did not look all that awesome. <laughs> I, I did not look all that, that cool. <laughs> it's a good thing they didn't have fail army back then, right? No, You've no. been right in the middle oh, of fail army. Viral instantly, right? right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and so, <laughs> so I, uh, in my, all my humility, pick myself up, go get my bike, put the grips back on, and I got out of Dodge really quick. <laughs> I was trying so hard to portray someone that I wasn't. I was, and the truth was, I was a mess, just like everyone, but man, I didn't want them to know that. I wanted to see how great I was. I tried to cover that up, and I was tremendously humiliated because of that. Well, you know what? There is tremendous value in humbling ourselves, especially when we choose it, though. Don't let God do it to you like what happened to me, because that's not a good time. But there is, there is such value in, humil in humbling ourselves, because humility changes us. It changes our outlook on life. It changes the way we see our lives. So don't let pride stand in the way of humbling yourself before the Lord. Because when we do, when we humble ourselves before the Lord, something just amazing happens. It actually happens in, in heaven when we humble ourselves and we seek repentance. And this was a resounding theme of Jesus, Jesus' ministry on earth and the stories that he told. I want to read one of them for you. It's from Luke 15. He told a story, and, and it says before he gets into the story, it says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to Jesus to listen to him teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. So he was, he, well, he was hanging out with the broken. And so it says, so Jesus told him this story, and he goes on, he says, if a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness to go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And this section right here is where the rubber meets the road. He then replies, in the same way. Get this, he's saying, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner that, or who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. When we humble ourselves and we repent, heaven parties. It's that big of a deal. Yeah. To, to turn the head of the creator of the yeah. universe our way. We humble ourselves. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Back to the story of Manasseh. This is exactly what he does, and God does exactly what he promises. Second Chronicles uh, 33, 13, and when he prayed, he being Manasseh, okay, back to our story, the Lord listened to him and was moved by his request. Mm -hmm. See, God's desire is to rebuild our broken lives. And Manasseh not only broke his life, but the lives of everyone he led and influenced around him. You know, if, if I was a judge, I'd be like, Manasseh, if I'm God, right? Mm -hmm. Squish you. You're done, buddy. Mm -hmm. You're done. We're, we're, we're going to start over with somebody else. But God chose instead to listen and hear and do what he promised to Manasseh's 
humble request for forgiveness. Mm. It's never, ever too late, ever. See, our sin forms us, but it doesn't define us. It doesn't contain all that we are. Sam's sin has formed me, but it doesn't define me. Yeah. It doesn't encapsulate all of who Sam is. You are not your mistakes. I am not my mistakes. Mm -hmm. They've shaped me, okay? They've shaped me. Mm -hmm. But God's love and redemption has formed me. And that's what's going on in Manasseh right now. Yeah, and that is the beautiful thing about God. The thing, I, I love God for so many reasons, but the fact that, that uh, he delights in taking what is broken and restoring it is an awesome thing. Uh, the, with repentance comes restoration. When we, repeat, when we repent, then we experience that restoration, and God delights in doing that, in restoring us back to our original purpose. I want to share another story with you, not quite as funny as the last one, uh, but a story in which I experienced restoration. Restoration of my purpose in life. Uh, a number of you know this, but uh, years ago, many years ago, uh, I went through a divorce with my first wife. And it was an ugly, difficult, painful uh, thing. And I remember thinking and, and even believing uh, that God would never restore me back to ministry because I was a youth pastor at the time. And I thought, I'm done. I'm done. There, there's no way God could use someone who's gone through such a horrible thing like divorce. I was convinced that I was sidelined. And I remember thinking, God, why on earth? Why would you uh, send me on this journey of preparing for ministry, equipping me to do ministry, and then allowing this to happen in my life? I just don't understand. And I was convinced I was done. I was convinced I was sidelined. And I, was, I remember thinking, there's no way a church would ever hire a someone who has gone through a situation like like I have. But you know what? I soon learned that God was not finished with me. And I praise God for godly men and women who came along, uh, or came around me and opened God's word and began to remind me that God is not through. I remember being angry at God. And they come and say, no, God is not done. God is not through with you. And through the encouragement of these pastors, I began to realize that my greatest days of ministry were on the other side of my pain. That if I could journey with Jesus and humble myself and walk through this pain, my greatest days are still ahead. And I remember, okay, God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you with this promise. And I humbled myself, and I followed him through that, and he restored me. He restored me back into ministry. He restored my promise purpose. In fact, he has used my leadership in greater ways than I had ever dreamed of because of that experience and because of allowing him to restore me. My divorce, it formed me. It truly did. But you know what? It did not define me. That mess did not define me. It formed me. It prepared me, but it didn't define me. Yeah. And so please hear us, both of us, describing our stories and Brian describing his very painful stories as an invitation for you to do the same, to allow God into your brokenness and do the same. When we let him do that, transformation happens. And as a result, other people experience God too. Other people hear about this God and want to be a part of it. We can't help but be changed by this transformation, this transformational power of repentance and grace, and it affects those around us. Ministries at Foothills have been started as a result mm. of these exact situations. Our personal convictions, they form in us this desire to go, God changed me. He can do it for other people, and I want to be a part of that as well. Now, this last summer, uh, or Actually, it's the month. same summer. Yeah, the last <laughs> month. It's, it's happened really fast. I took a group of high school students to California, and uh, we sweat out in the middle of a field somewhere, and we sweat out in this peach processing plant, and the whole idea of this place is that, that this processing plant takes the discarded, thrown away fruit that isn't visually acceptable okay, that has bumps and bruises and that's kind of not real pretty, nothing you would buy in the grocery store. It takes that discarded fruit and it processes it 
through, the, through volunteer labor with groups just like ours, dries it out and sends it to the people who need it the most, who are literally dying without food. If that is not a beautiful picture of God's grace and transformation, I don't know what is. Here is the discarded fruit that visually is unacceptable, full of bumps and bruises mm -hmm. that God uses for the people who need it the most. It was absolutely powerful. Now check out what happens next with Manasseh. He experiences this forgiveness, and we move forward in our story, okay? Now, Manasseh prays out to God, or cries out to God, and God forgives him, okay? And uh, we don't know what happens or how, what happens next, but the Bible in uh, 2 Chronicles just describes that Manasseh starts becoming the king he should have been in the very beginning, okay? He rebuilds the outer wall, which is super awesome because it defends the people and protects the people of God. This is what a king's job was supposed to be. He tears down all the pagan idols that were built or he had built. He stations military officers on the wall so they're not overrun by Assyrians anymore. He begins to right the wrongs that he, uh, you know, did, the violations that he did. It was a big deal. And as a result, the people of Judah do the same thing. They start to follow God again, okay? And all of this is because of the grace of God. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Never underestimate the power of grace because restoration is the result of grace. It comes about because of God's grace. Second Chronicles 33, the story that he just uh, walked through, it says, so the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. That, folks, was an act of grace because he did not deserve that. He deserved judgment, he deserved punishment, and instead he received grace. Grace, folks, is nothing less than a gift. It is a gift from God held out to every single one of us. Now, sometimes we get mercy and grace a little bit mixed up. Uh, think of it this way. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, right? But grace, on the other hand, is getting what you don't deserve. Manasseh did not deserve that, and God gave him this gift of grace, and he wants to do the same for each of us. Absolutely. Now, it's important to note that this is quite the story, that this man and all of his atrocities were written down in the Old Testament, and then he immediately gets to be restored back to the throne and go back to a really awesome way of life as king, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but when I screw up, it doesn't always look like that. Even if I ask God for forgiveness, God determines what restoration looks like. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of a rosy picture of restoration. Yeah. And we want to make sure that you know that because maybe you're still dealing with the consequences of that doesn't mean that God has left you in any way, shape, or form. Okay? God defines our restoration, not ourselves. But we always have a God that says, come back to me. Mm -hmm. Come back to me. Come back to me. And maybe, I'm just going to guess, because I'm not God, I'm just Sam, okay, which is a mess, all right? But I'm just going to guess that God chose to restore Manasseh the way that he did so that the entire world at the time knew that God was the restorer, the breaker of chains, the great forgiver the God of grace. Imagine the story that they could tell about this God, okay? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says this about our God. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find what? Grace. We'll find grace to help us when we need it most. James 4, 6 says, and he gives grace, I love this, generously. He wants to heap it on us. He gives grace generously, as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to whom? The humble. Gives grace to the humble. Grace is free, unmerited favor from God. And with grace comes freedom. When we take that gift of grace, that is when we experience freedom, freedom from guilt, 
Freedom from the inner turmoil that we find ourselves living with. Freedom from the tension. Freedom from the lies we have to tell and convince ourselves of. It sets us free from that. Grace brings freedom from shame. Shame before God and freedom brings shame, uh, breaks us from the shame that we live out before other people in our lives. And when we experience that, we experience freedom from the fear of being caught. I think we've all felt that, right? That fear where I always have to look over my shoulder wondering who's going to see. Who's going to see what I'm doing? I know some of us in this room right now are trapped in the cycle of having to always erase our browser history on our devices because someone might find out. Someone might see that. And God wants to set you free from that. Wherever we're at in life, whatever mess we find ourselves in, God says, here's this gift, this gift of grace, and I want to set you free from that. And here's a big but. Yeah, that's not nice. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Freedom requires action. Yeah. To experience, yeah. This, experience this freedom, we've got to do something. Yes. Otherwise, we're still in prison with the Assyrians with a hook in our nose or ring in our nose and chains. Yeah. We have to act. Freedom requires action. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to take a difficult step forward. Guys, don't dismiss yourself from this story today. Mm -hmm. There is something in each one of our lives that we need to take a step forward in and find freedom from today. Manasseh's evil brought invasion and defeat. It brought death to innocent people. His story is written in uh, one of the oldest parts of the Bible of all the evil this man did, and it brought defeat. Our sin, our list, will bring our own defeat and the defeat of those around us. Fathers, the defeat of our children. Mothers, the defeat of your children. Manasseh's repentance, though, brought restoration to his life and the lives of people around him. And our repentance will bring us restoration as God defines it. So what's your first step? What's your first step? Here at Foothills Church, we be, believe in being transparent with one another, with people we can trust, godly people. We've got a prayer team in the corner. If you're that bold today, that you can walk up to the prayer team and say, I need prayer for this. Now is your time. This is your moment. Maybe it means a cup of coffee, a conversation with somebody who's godly, who loves God. If you don't know someone like that, come find me or Bri and we'll get you with someone. You can talk through these things. But we've got to take a step forward. Maybe you have deeper pain, pain that's not going to be fixed with a couple conversations. We have a counselor here at Foothills Church because we believe in transformation. And Cindy can be a part of this. Cindy can be used by God to help you overcome and me overcome incredible things. She is a licensed counselor. Uh, details are in the bulletin uh, for how to contact her. But this could be a great step forward into freedom and grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah. Until we take those steps, you and I put this together. We both know we've lived it, and we encourage those that are struggling today to hear this. Until those steps are taken, until you choose action, there is no life, there is no air, there is no truth, there is only desperation. Mm -hmm. So let's move forward today, together. Let me close with this psalm, okay? Psalm 107, a couple of verses out of there. And I love this psalm. Uh, but I found this one. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom. We've all been there in our sins. Some sat in darkness, deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery because of our own actions, or because of the, the sins of the people around us. These people, they rebelled against the words of God. I rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That is why God broke them with hard labor. It's a lot of work to cover your sin. They fell, and no one was there to help them. Lord, help, they cried out in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and deepest gloom, and he snapped their chains of misery. Let them praise the Lord for his great love. 
for, and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he broke down their prison gates of bronze. He cut apart their bars of iron. Mm. Praise God, wow. the breaker of chains. Yeah, amen. Let's pray. Let's thank him for that. Father God, we thank you that you are a bondage breaker, that you want to snap our chains. Lord, that you hold out your hand and say, just come, come to me. Humble yourself and find forgiveness. Accept my grace and be restored and be set free from the stuff that has you in bondage. Lord, what a tremendous gift that is. Lord, we thank you for this amazing story of Manasseh that illustrates it so beautifully. And Lord, I pray that every single one of us would, would, would be a story like that, that we would have a story to tell the world, the story of being restored, the story of your grace. Lord, we want that to be the story of Foothills. God, we want this community and the world around us to look at Foothills and say, that is a place, that is a community of people that has experienced God's grace, that have been set free from the mess of this world and are living in freedom. Lord, we want to be that kind of people. Lord, so thank you for being a God that delights in taking what is broken and restoring it to its original purpose. God, we love you and we worship you for that reason in this moment. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen.